Stay tuned for Butler on Business, coming up next on the Liberty Express. And welcome back to Butler on Business. My name is Jason Riddle, joined in the studio with Alan Butler, and we are joined on the phone now by Dan Senior. He's the adjunct senior fellow for Middle Eastern Studies at the Council on Foreign Relations and co-author of Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle. Now, Israel and the Middle East get a lot of political coverage, but what is often underreported is that Israel's really become a leader in the global business world, especially in the technology sector. Dan, how are you doing today, and what is Israel doing right? Uh, It's good to be with you. Thanks for uh, having me on. Uh, Look, Israel has managed to build one of the most dynamic entrepreneurial innovation, knowledge-based economies on the planet. It's got the highest density of startups in the world. On a per capita basis, it attracts more global venture capital than any country in the world, including the U.S., two and a half times more than the United States, 30 times more than Europe, 80 times more than China, over 300 times more than India. More Israeli companies on the tech-centric NASDAQ exchange than any country in the world outside of China and the United States. It's got one of the lowest unemployment rates in the OECD right now, one of the strongest currencies. And this is perplexing. This is perplexing to my co-author and myself uh, because it's not a place without uh, chaos and geopolitical risks surrounding it. It's a country surrounded by adversaries in a state of war since its founding, virtually no access to natural resources and zero access to regional capital and, and, and regional markets. So we, at a time when the United States is going through this, um, you know, we're trying to navigate a global economic crisis that doesn't seem to go away, that question was crystallized for us. What has Israel done? How, how has it managed to pull this off from the least likely of places? What can the U.S. learn from Israel? And, and that's why we started to get to work on this book a couple of years ago, Startup Nation. Well, in the book, Startup Nation, you outline one key factor is Israel's policy on immigration and assimilation. Can you can you talk about how that has actually helped spur their economy and their business sector? Yeah, sure. Israel has one of the most progressive immigration policies of any country on the planet. Uh, Two out of every three Israelis is an immigrant, the child of an immigrant or the grandchild of an immigrant. So over 70 nationalities represented in the country from literally all over the world, Ethiopia, Ukraine, Australia, the United States, I mean, Iraq, Iran, there are immigrants to Israel from all over the place. And they have very innovative policies, not only for immigrating people, but for assimilating them. The emphasis they put on all Hebrew language immersion so that there, there aren't these, these um, there's not a balkanized country where different parts of the country are speaking different languages and it's very hard for there to be real integration, seamless integration. Everybody goes through an all-consuming almost full-time for six to 12 months upon arrival, uh, English immersion, while the government and the, and the civil society, the civic society has all various programs to help people get plugged in economically. Um, so they do a lot of innovative stuff on immigration and assimilation. And if you look at the startups in Israel, uh, some of them are, most of them actually have some great immigrant success story. We argue in the book that immigrants are the ultimate entrepreneurs, they're the ultimate risk takers. Immigrants anywhere, immigrants to the United States, immigrants to Israel, they know what it means to face adversity, they know what it means to start anew, to build a life, to try to build something better from which they came. And you look at Shai Agassi, who's building this company called Better Place, which is the first uh, national infrastructural grid to support battery-operated electric cars. You look at the guy who started this company called Kulanu, which is one of the largest online social networking sites in China. It's an Israeli company. It's called Kulanu, but it's one of the largest sites in China. You know, Shai Gassi comes from Iraq. His family comes from Iraq. Uh, the, the founder of Kulanu's family comes from Iran. Uh, you see in the 1990s, Israel immigrated and assimilated a fifth of its population. It would be the equivalent of the United States in the next decade. Uh, immigrating and assimilating 60, 60, 60 million people on a proportionate basis. So you have all this talent coming, very ambitious, very energetic, very hardworking, and they come to Israel not only to build a new life, but they wind up building a lot of companies too. Dan, I used to, when I owned a couple of manufacturing companies, I employed a very large number of Israelis. And I will Mm -hmm. say this, overwhelmingly, they were some of the hardest working people I I ever met. And in my travels overseas, I have never been made to feel more welcome as an American than I was when I was in Israel. They really yeah. seem to like the Americans. Oh, well, the relationship, that, but look, there's two levels here. 
which, which you're speaking to is spot on. The bilateral relationship between the United States and Israel is strong. Uh, it goes back generations. It goes back through political parties, administrations of both political parties. Uh, it's a very deep relationship. Security uh, partnership between the United States military and the Israeli military is very tight. But what you're speaking to is even more powerful, which is cultural to cultural, people to people. And that emanates from shared values, shared experiences. Uh, I was just in Israel a few weeks ago, and Prime Minister Netanyahu, I was in a meeting with Prime Minister Netanyahu, who was meeting with a group of congressmen from Washington. And he kept saying to them, we are you and you are us. Meaning we, 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 we're both pioneering countries. Uh, we both share the same values. We both have built free market uh, economies, and we live in democratic countries with real rule of law and real minority protections and all the rest, freedom of speech, freedom of religion. Um, and, uh, and, and so there, I, I have no doubt that as an American, you felt very welcome in, in Israel. In our book, we profile a number of Israeli successful Israeli startups. We also profile a number of American companies that have done business in Israel, set up R&D operations there, Google, eBay, Cisco, PayPal. Uh, Intel. Intel is the second largest employer in Israel. They they export about a billion dollars a year of chips out of Israel. Some of the most advanced chips to power our laptops were designed and manufactured in Israel. The president of PayPal, Scott Thompson, he he said that that, that, that uh, R&D center that well became an R&D center was a company he bought in Israel called Fraud Sciences. Literally changed PayPal overnight. And he'd never been to Israel. He'd never in a million years imagined doing business in Israel. And he showed up in Israel, and he's sitting there thinking, what am I doing? I'm going to a military war zone. What did I get myself into? And he showed up there, and he says there's no place now that he feels more comfortable doing business. You know, the other thing I think people are surprised when you tell them is how pretty the women are. I mean, those, well, those, I, Sephardic, <laughs> those Sephardic women are absolutely gorgeous. It's a uh, it's a it's a very dynamic place. It's a very young and energetic place. People like Tel Aviv are uh, places like Tel Aviv. You know, we, we they call it the city that never sleeps. It's uh, you spend time in Tel Aviv. You're on the Mediterranean. Uh, you're going out at night. You're doing business by day. You feel like you could be you know anywhere in the world. It's amazing to think that you're sitting there in between, you know, Syria and nearby Iran and near this you know all, all these countries that are that are in turmoil. Dan, one of the other interesting factors that you draw attention to in the book Startup Nation is Israel's successful model for integrating military personnel back into the economy. Can you talk a little bit about that and what we might be able to learn from that here in the United States? Yeah, this has been one of the most interesting things we discovered when we were writing the book. Uh, look, every single, almost every single Israeli serves in the military. They, age 18, when they finish high school, they go into the Army, and they get a crucible leadership experience during that time. Before they go to college, they do this a formative time in their lives. They learn what it means to lead, what it means to manage, what it means to have lives on the line, what it means to have to make difficult decisions with imperfect, ambiguous information every single day. High-stakes stuff. They're given a lot of responsibility at a very junior age. And then they, after they do that for three years, four years, depending on whether or not they go on to officer training school or into one of the elite units, they then go to college. And then by the time they're 25, they have have this dynamic combination of great university post-secondary education with this boot camp for leadership training. We call them battlefield entrepreneurs. They're like hardwired for leadership and running organizations and, 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 and hardwired for improvisational decision-making. When we speak to Eric Schmidt, the executive chairman of Google, who Google has a huge R&D center in Israel. They've, the Google team in Israel has developed some of the most central – and critical features on the Google homepage. Google suggests where you type in a few letters in the search bar and you get 20 different suggestions and you click on one. That, that's a feature that was developed in Israel to actually solve a problem that was in China. But a lot of these companies have R&D centers in Israel, and they all say the CEO of these companies. Meg Whitman told us this when she was at eBay. She's in the news today. Uh, Eric Schmidt told us this. You take the average Israeli 25-year-old, and you put him or her up against their peers around the world, you'll be hard-pressed to find anyone that matches the Israelis in talent at that young age, it's not that the talent over time, over life, but at that young age, because of this military experience. And it's not just the military experience, it's that the whole Israeli economy is literate. Businesses are literate about how to read a military resume. So you've got a young guy coming out of the Army, and he's trying to raise venture capital for a deal, or he's for a company he started, he's going to work at a company. The first question the investors or the employer asks him is not, 
what college you went to. The first question they ask him is, where did you serve in the Army? Everyone's literate. And we tell a story in the book, we compare it to the U.S., because we think there's a lot the U.S. can learn from Israel here. <clears throat> the, the American economy, American business world is completely illiterate today about military experience. We, we tell a story of a young officer from Iraq who fought in Fallujah, comes back to the United States, amazing young guy, you know, commanded security forces, commanded raids, was also, by, by, by day, he was a tribal negotiator, he was opening schools, he was, he was setting up waste management facilities, he was trying to reconstruct the, the town in Fallujah. Comes back from Iraq, develops some amazing interdisciplinary skills, he's applying for a job, uh, in Silicon Valley with a major company whose name I won't mention. And the corporate recruiter is listening to him describe all his experiences. At the end of the interview, he says, the, the recruiter says, well, that's all very nice and very interesting, but have you ever had a real job? It, it's tragic. And, and we hear the story over and over and over. People here don't understand what it means to serve in the military and how those skill sets developed in the battlefield are directly transferable to business leadership. And that's we talk a lot about in the book how America, in very specific and concrete ways, can learn from Israel in terms of um, expanding this, this literacy about the military. And it's not just a debt we owe to our men and women returning from Iraq and Afghanistan. It's an opportunity. It's an opportunity for us at a time when we need young leaders. Dan, how was it being the chief spokesman, spokesperson for the U.S.-led coalition during those years? I remember seeing you on TV. I always thought you did a... A great job, and you were just one of those faces that that you just grew to like watching a fellow on TV. What what was it like over there, doing that? Well, uh, thank you. It was it was um, it was scary, but important work. Uh, it was uh, I was there for about 15 months, and I was living in a trailer behind the uh, behind our headquarters. And you know, we were it was it was. Uh, it was a scary time. It was a difficult time over there, and you know, there were colleagues of mine were killed. Somebody who worked for me was killed, and uh, it was not. Uh, it was, um, you know, I, I guess I had it easy. Uh, I was on the front lines, uh, like so many of these amazing men and women who have served. Um, but uh, it was also very rewarding work because I I believed in what we were trying to do. I still believe in what we're trying to do there, and. Um, you know, I, I didn't have a hand in everything we did, but I, the work that I that I was involved with, it was uh, you know to try and to try and build some modicum of a democracy, however imperfect, um, in a in a heart in the heart of the region that's never really known it before. Uh, working with these young Iraqis, who many of whom were traumatized by the three years, three decades of life under the the Ba'athist regime. Uh, was filled with all sorts of challenges and was very frustrating. But but on balance, it was a, a rewarding experience, if uh, albeit quite difficult. Any any ideas or theory on what happened to that eight billion dollars in cash that, that disappeared? Well, it was it was. Uh, I mean, what happened was when we got to Iraq, it was it was eight billion dollars of Iraqi money. They were Iraqi dinars, not not U.S. dollars. Oh, okay. When we got to, uh, yeah, yeah. There's a little. There's been some misreporting on that. But we got to Iraq. There was uh, no banking system. There was no checking system. There was no. There was nothing. Um, and we had a government. Uh, we had a country of 27 million people. We had a, almost 28, 30 government ministries with employees up and down the bureaucracy that we needed technocrats to help run the country so the whole place didn't totally collapse. Uh, we had to put people to work. We had no system for doing it because it was a third world accounting system. Uh, inside Iraq, inside the government. And so we literally, Jay Garner, our General Garner, who was head of the Office of Reconstruction and Humanitarian Assistance, a great American, basically said, get those dinars in the back of those pickup trucks and start paying people. Because if you think we've got a problem now with the insurgency, it's going to double, triple, quadruple overnight if people are getting paid and they can't put food on their table. So will become instant recruits for the insurgency. And so they had to deploy Iraqi dinars quickly. Now, they could have waited for first world accounting systems to be in place, and they could have waited for a checking and banking system to be uh, constituted before they did that, and that would have been 6, 12, 18 months into it, and we would have probably had a lot of bloodshed as a result. Dan, you've been a great guest, and I hope this book does very well for you. Jason, tell them about the book one more time. Startup Nation, the story of Israel's economic miracle. There's a lot of lessons in there that we can learn here at home. Dan, thank you very much for calling. All right. Hey, good to be with you guys. Thanks. Good. Have a good afternoon.